yeah, this is, I'm going to talk about the Balmer spectrum of cellular two complete sigma two spectra. And um, that's a lot of adjectives, and we'll get into why I need all those restrictions in a bit. Um, and everything I say today, or most of it, is going to be joint work with Gary Strzokowski and Ishan Mali. Um, OK, and so you know, section one of this talk um, is going to be some generalities on all the And so the you know kind of first thing is I'm just going to mention is that um, so due to I believe Stone we have an equivalence between bounded distributed lattices and spectral topological spaces. So bounded distributed lattices and the opposite of this can be equivalent to spectral topological spaces. And so, you know, what, what is this equivalence doing? You know, if I have some x here, what you send it to would be the, maybe the opposite of the lattice of quasi-compact opens. And so, you know, one way you can get the Balmer spectrum is you can talk about the Balmer spectrum as being what happens if I take some, you know, symmetric renoidal C, or let's say generated by a dualizable object, and I send it to the lattice of thick tensor ideals of the form. You know, the, it's the ones that are finitely generated. So, equivalent of them is the fixed tensor ideals generated by choices of objects in X. Um, and so, working at the level of this lattice, I find to be often much more concrete because I get to just think about, you know, objects up to some equivalence relation. Um, and what it also does is it lets me quickly define a couple quotients of the warmer spectrum that I'm going to be using at various points in this talk. Um, or I guess things that emit a surjective map, not necessarily quotient spaces. Um, so as a definition, um, so suppose we're given a collection E of objects in C. And um, I want this to be closed under Sums and tensors. Um, I'll, you know, we'll write spec brackets e of c for the sublattice of it tends to write as the form thing in E. And so the, the reason for considering this, you know, sort of a, because there's an inclusion of lattices from the lattices where they're sort of supported on the objects in E into the lattice of all things, you're going to get a surjective map at the level of topological spaces. Um, and you know, if we put together a collection of E of objects that I find it easy to construct, then you know, and then separately prove that this, you know, this inclusion of lattices is actually isomorphism, it makes an, an analyzing things a lot easier. It sort of gives me a language to talk about the objects I find easy to build, because often sort of the the last and hardest step in analyzing the Balmer spectrum of some category like cellular two complete quantific spectra is the part where I need to say I need a closed set right here, right now. I need to have quasi-compact open complement, so I need an object. And I, you know, it, it's a hard task to sort of know, you know, know where those objects are going to come from. Um, 
So let me write down some sources of sort of things like this um, and sort of what they lead to. So yeah. Oh, and then if if uh, this is the whole lattice. We'll say uh, C is E separable. Because the idea is that you're finding that you can separate points in this space using only the objects in E that are sort of easy to, to reach. Okay. So as an example, we might take um, the class that I'm calling M, which you know is for things that look like a Moore spectrum to me. So that's you know things that are generated by you know I take the unit and I take the cofiber if I sum that V, where V is in let's say there. So this would be the something like you know pick graded endomorphisms of you know. And so in the case where, you know, maybe you restrict the card graded, just integer graded, then this is, you know, the objects of this type, so, you know, sums and tensor product of these, are the things you would see when you're looking at the, um, the homogeneous spectrum of pi star. And so what this is going to reproduce is it's going to reproduce a variant of the map from the Balmer spectrum to the homogeneous spectrum of pi star. That, it won't be the exact same though, because in the example of uh, A2 minus the origin, you know, at the level of pi star, you don't know that the origin in A2 minus the origin is missing. Because, you know, at the level of the homotopy groups, you get K join XY and then a whole bunch of divisible stuff. Um, but, you know, if I took homogeneous spectrum, all that nilpotent stuff goes away and I should just get A2. Um, but it's the fact that I took the sublattice here, not a guess of the sublattice that's, that makes it slightly different. Um, but you should think of this class M as approximately like, you know, capturing the objects that I know are there because I can build them, you know, because I know the homogeneous spectrum of the unit. Um, and so, you know, as a, as a sub-example of this example, and this is like a meta-example, it's an example of a concept, and now here's an example of the example in use. Um, you know, we have the, the results of Benson, uh, mm. Edengar, and Krause that are going to tell us that, um, you know, for example, um, representations of G with coefficient in K, um, that this guy is M separable. So, okay. And this is also all, my only example, there would have been no reason to introduce this definition, but let's go to another example where things get a little harder to see. You know, if those are things that look like more spectra to me, being a, a stable homotopy theorist at heart, there's the things that look like generalized more spectra. And so these are going to be the um, things that are generated by iterated quotients by central self maps. Um, starting with the unit. <coughs> okay. And as an example of this example, what we have is, you know, due to Hopkins and Smith, we have the category of spectra, where in the category of spectra, if we allow ourselves to start with the unit of the sphere spectrum and then iteratively quotient by central self maps, we're going to get type and complexes ever very tight. And we know that that allows us to see all of the, the closed sets of quasi-compact complement of the Balmer spectrum. And so um, we see that this guy is GM separable. <clears throat> but not 
M separable. And then maybe I'll, for good measure, just kind of draw a picture of the Balmer spectrum of this thing. Um, so it's got, you know, a point, you know, plus minus to height zero, and point plus minus to height one. And then add one to infinity. And there's specializations between these going And I'm going to call this space H because it's, it's going to come up in a lot of places in this talk because, well, cellular, you know, C2, two complete C more to spectra are kind of like spectra. And so the Balmer spectrum of spectra is going to show up in a lot of places. So spectra, you know the spectra? Yes, sorry. Okay. Are there any questions at the moment? Uh, what is RepGK? Uh, RepGK is going to be the infinity cap, the stable infinity category of you know finite dimensional you know K modules with an action of G. Like I think that should be the same as the derived category of finite dimensional representations of G, but uh, I don't think well at the board. So this is not the derived category of KG, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yep. Okay, so now, what are the lot conditions on this theorem? Okay, <clears throat> so now we're going to start to head in the direction, which is, um, you know, I was a bit, I mean, you can see that that class is specified only by words, which is not always a good sign in the definition, because you can have to parse out what exactly a uh, iterated quotient by central self maps are, and how do you arrive at them, um, and are those even like a well-behaved notion, uh, but this theorem is going to tell you under a long list of conditions, that's actually a pretty well-behaved no notion, so suppose C is, um, Stable pseudo unital symmetric noidal rigid generated by the card elements. And P, I want to act nopidently on every object. Okay, I think the most mysterious word here is pseudo-unital. And what that is, is I, you know, I have a non-unital symmetric model structure here. And so I get a non-unital symmetric model structure on the int category. And I want to ask that in the int category, there's actually a unit. So the classic example here would be if you take um, like you know p complete abelian groups, the compact objects in that category is p torsion abelian groups, um, and you know, in, in the derived setting, the, the co-limit along you know z mod p going to z mod p squared going to z mod p cubed, you know, you're going to get q p mod z p, which would be complete to a copy of z p. And so you see the unit as being in the int category, even if it's not in the small category. Um, and for all the purposes of sort of talking about the Balmer spectrum and things like this, pseudo-unital is enough because this approximating system of the unit, you know, if you tensor with something compact, you're always going to get a retraction at some finite stage. And so that's just like a, a useful trick to know so that you can sort of talk about Balmer spectrum of, of categories of compact objects in, um, in completed categories or just categories of torsion objects where the unit wouldn't have been torsion. It's still close enough to having a so unit. So pseudo-unital is the unit yeah. Okay. Then, if I take the Picard graded endomorphisms <laughs> of an object X, and I take the center of this as a graded ring, and then I take the direct limit perfection, this thing only depends on the thing tensor ideal it generates. Okay, 
And so let me digest this a bit. You know, we're looking at an object X and the endomorphisms of it possibly twisted by some Picard element. And then we're wanting the ones that commute with every other endomorphism of X. And then we're taking the direct limit perfection here, which is just a way of saying I want to work up to F isomorphism, and saying you get the same thing, you know, if I pick any generator of the thick tensor ideal X lives in. I'm sorry, could you repeat the, the perf step? Uh, that's the direct limit perfection. And it's saying that, um, you know, if, if for different, let's say I have like Y and Z that both generate here, it's saying that when I don't include the perfection, I'll get two rings that are F isomorphic. And if I had taken the direct limit perfections, I just have a, a nice choice of isomorphism. <coughs> um, the, the prototype of this very complicated string of characters is living <coughs> here, where if we talk about like a type 3 spectrum, it's going to admit a V3 self map, but it doesn't really admit a V3 self map. It admits some power of a V3 self map. And if I have another one, it also admits a V3 self map. And if I have an arrow between them, the square you can draw easily doesn't need to com commute, but if I replace my powers, it, it starts to commute. And that's why you need this perfection and to start to begin to get a true statement. And the claim in this theorem is, is that you know, all of that stuff that you might be familiar with from the category of spectra wasn't a feature of the category of spectra and V ends. That was just a feature of P being a little bit nulled and, you know, having a stable category with, you know, rigidity assumptions. And if you're familiar with those arguments and you've run through them, in many places you'll see, well, you weren't actually using that VN is a VN, you're just kind of using that it's a, a thing that exists. Sorry, so, so in, the, in that, so you're saying the prototypical example would be torsion spec? Yes. Uh, so the, the prototypical example hmm. would be that um, if we look at you know spectra compact p complete so like torsion spectra um, and you know we have v being type n uh, then this thing here so i star n of v center perf is isomorphic to fp adjoined vn 1 over p infinity, and that didn't depend on the v I chose there at all. Mm. And this infinity business, this is perfection. Yeah. 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 If, you, if you work in the category of algebras <laughs> up to f isomorphism, I can start erasing perfs and just you have to keep track of zigzags of maps up to f isomorphism, but um, I, I find it, at least in stating it more elegant to say it this way. In using it, I always peel the perf off, select a power that, you know, acts on an object and, and move forward. Um, yeah, so with this theorem and a little bit more, uh, this lets us put a sheaf on the closed sets with quasi-compact open complement of the Walmer spectrum, which I call the periodicity sheaf. Um, okay, so using this, we get a periodicity sheet. And it really is a sheaf in the sense that if I have a, a closed set that's a union of two other closed sets, I really do get like a little Milner excision square for gluing these things together. And happily, because there's not really a such thing as a derived perfect algebra, I don't have to talk about anything derived here. It's just a pullback in ordinary or you know, perfect algebras. Um, and so now with this periodicity sheaf, you know, living here, we sort of come to a better understanding of this definition here, at least under all that list of conditions, which is that if I start with the unit, you know, whatever object that's generating the, the unit, you know, or the you know the, the bottom of the category. There's kind of one ring I can look at to start taking quotients with. And when I start taking those quotients, I get a, a new support and I get a new ring. And that new ring is the thing I can select elements from to take further quotients. And so it makes this whole procedure a much more structured. Um, and I don't have an explanation for this yet, but in a lot of cases, sort of, you can write down a stack where the periodicity sheet on the ball, like, 
you know, I have some category and then I can compute its Balmer spectrum and then I can separately write down a stack such that the global sections of the structure sheaf on closed sets matches with the Balmer spectrum with its periodicity sheaf. Um, and so, I mean, there should be, you know, you might interpret sort of that M there as sort of the quasi affine, the case when the Balmer spectrum is quasi affine in this GM case as sort of when it's, um, you know, some sort of unipotent stackiness is allowed. The, the periodicity sheet to some object, what's the relation to this object, the perfection of the thing? Is that? That's the value of the periodicity sheet at the closed set. On the closed set, not yeah. the Okay. Yeah, it's. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> I'm sorry, so, so this is it to the standards uh, higher comparison map? Hmm? There's a construction by Baron Sanders of higher comparison maps. Are you aware of that? No. So, well, he does essentially that, right? So he says there's a comparison map, and then you take, you take the cone of, a, of an object, of a map, and then you look at this object, and then there's a comparison map to the endomorphism of that object, and you can keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's very closely related to this. Yeah. Anyway, stop. I mean, the, the thing that's a little... It's a separate thing, but it's very related. It, it's very... I mean, it probably it produces the same output um, in these conditions. What always made me worried without this theorem about thinking about this is that in the rational case, you can come up with examples where um, the central endomorphisms is not a braided variant thing. Or like, where you have two objects in the same support and you get different choices of non milpotent endomorphisms you get to quotient by. And it always felt a little... Like, you know, after I came up with some examples where that was the case, it always felt a little weird to me because then it's like, you know, I can't just pick an arbitrary object in the support and find the self-maps I can quotient by. Some of them have self-maps that I couldn't have seen if I looked at a different thing, in the, you know, that generates the same thing that's not ideal. And that, you know. I, I don't remember exactly. I, I think he had conditions for the next map to be, at each step you have to have a condition to have the next map to be fine. That's how you get those. This sort of power of comparison map, and if you apply it in, in the spectra, you get the, the whole story. Yeah, I'll have to take a look at this. Yeah, yeah. and so I'm going to abandon this clipboard thing. Um, what this leads to is this leads to a, a you know a question you can ask in a lot of different categories that's well defined in the sense that like. It, my selection of object matters very little, it's just the support of the object matters, that is, what is the purity of the city sheaf? Um, and so let me pose this question in that generality. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a Quite neat question. I mean, I've thought about it, and uh, Yishan Levy and I have worked out what happens here in the case of CP equivariant homotopy theory, and it would be great to know what the answer is in all sorts of other, you know, equivariant homotopy theories. You know, you could ask this, like, you know, you know, we get this over C, but if we talk about R motivic, I really have not, you know, not the foggiest idea. You know, sort of in every case, there was a, a Balmer spectrum, and we were kind of in a piatic setting. There's a a new question you can ask that sort of refines things. Um, and I guess maybe from what I was recently told, you could already ask the, the sub-question, but it seems to me in every case I know how to compute a Balmer spectrum of something, it always ends up being uh, GM separable in this sense. And I just don't know so many examples where that's not the case. I mean, I find it very hard to know how I write down an object if it's not by iterative quotients. Um, you know, like on, you know, on, on projective varieties, you know, these allowing uh, line bundles there, you know, really means everything's quotients even there. So I really like to see some examples where we can compute it and this doesn't apply and, you know, what techniques push us further there. But, uh... okay, so let's see. And now I'm going to need one more lemma, and then we're going to finally get to talking about motives. So let's suppose that C is 
presentable symmetric monoidal, the closed symmetric T. Presentable symmetric monoidal and uh, compactly generated by dualizable objects. And we have a map, let's call it again B, from L to the unit, where this guy is on the card element. And one mod V admits a commutative algebra structure. And I should say here, really, E4 is enough. Then, well, we can look at, you know, we have, say, D compact. We have a uh, puncture out of that, tensoring with one mod D. And that's going to go to modules in D over one more V, compact objects. And we could also invert V, and so we get two uh, modules in D over the unit with V inverted. Compact objects there. And upon taking Bolmer spectra on this, we're gonna get a little diagram that cuts the Bolmer spectrum of D, or D's compact objects, up into a open piece and a closed piece, and that this uh, partitions it. So this is, we have an open subset where we invert V, and we have a closed set where we've modded out by it. Yeah, so this is an open inclusion and a closed inclusion, and their uh, union contains all points. So the easy version of this that's much more clear is that I have the, uh, the you know the localization where I've inverted V, and the subcategory I killed to make that localization, which would be the V torsion objects. And this is a sort of Debussage result that says I can, instead of working with V-torsion objects, I can just work with module over one mod V. And this allows me to sort of clean things up every time I pass through a torsion subcategory because I can just work on the, you know, it's, it is what Debussage is. It, it lets me work exactly on the, the reduced closed locus. Um, and what's kind of notable here is, is that because this is a closed inclusion, it says that, um, you know, when you, when you have these, you know, commutative algebras that I can define the category of module of, is of, um, you know, the Balmer spectrum actually didn't depend on the choice of algebra structure. There might a priori have been many choices of algebra structure on this guy, but those choices didn't affect what the spectrum looked like. Um, so what collection of objects is triangle and spectrangle? Sorry, this is just uh, the Balmer spectrum. I could erase the triangle, like... Oh, oh. Uh, I could say all, I brackets all. <laughs> Is E4 because one all the E2 category to be infinity? I, I want the homotopy category to be symmetric monoidal. Which one? So that's E3 is well? Uh, if the ring is E4, the category the of modules is E3. Yeah. So, so you somehow don't need the ring on the homotopy 2 category? I don't think so. Okay. Probably can get, get away with less. I think the braiding won't really mess you up, if I recall correctly. Other people might have thought about this more recently than I. Okay. More spectra people have this. Hmm? The condition is, is 
what the restrictive, right? In this, this existence of a, I don't know what restrictive means. Uh, so let's say I take S mod 2 to the 12. That's going to be an E5 algebra. <laughs> mm. If you go higher, you can get more structure. If you want, like, E to the, you know, E to the 2 to the 37, I can go find a number where S mod that power of 2 is that. No, no, that's interesting. So you're saying that if you, if you set a general statement, if you raise V to higher powers, then you, you get that. Yeah. I have a, a paper that proves in great generality that as soon as one mod V admits a multiplication, one mod the n plus first power of V is an EN algebra. Yeah. So you got that paper. This is a cool paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in the rest, in most of this talk, I won't actually try and apply this to something like P. I'm mostly going to, very quickly, I'm going to be talking about moduli formal groups, which is a, an algebraic stack. And when I want to quotient by P, I'm going to do it in a classical way where, you know, my thing lives over respect Z and I can quotient by P for that reason. Um, but I mean, that this result of mine is what motivated me to include this aside, which is that this, re this condition is actually very non-restrictive if you let put a power there. But you get yourself into a little bit of a hell if you do this once, but then because you're thinking in that way, you want to do it again, because your algebra structure is going to decay a bit. And so if you want to go 10 steps down the line, at the first point, you need to say, OK, I know I'm going to go 10 steps down the line. I need this much e ahead of time. And it can lead to some very like unfortunately structured arguments. But OK. Well, now that you say that, I've got to just go with reckless abandon. I know some people who, when I saw them giving talks, it's like, wow, they must have a lot of practice on this. It's like perfect and they move quickly. Um, okay. See what to expect to finally enter the game. So. So what is this category? We're thinking about SHFC, a stable homotopic homotopy category over C. And well, that's a really complicated category. Um, I mean, it has some good properties. Many of them are sort of categorical. It's stable, presentable, symmetric, monoidal. It's you know, generated by dualizable objects. Um, let me just say you know, the, the dualizable generators are, you know, suspension infinity plus of x, where x is some smooth variety over c. And on the one hand, that's nice. I mean, we have these dualizable generators that are smooth and, and very well behaved. On the other hand, I, I know very well that I don't have a handle over the collection of all smooth varieties over c. And so there's probably no hope of approaching something like the Balmer spectrum of this if I don't like really, really know what the minimal model program is supposed to tell me about like, you know, moduli of choices of varieties that could show up here. And I really, really don't know that. So we're gonna need to do some restrictions before I can say anything interesting. So we're gonna restrict to the cellular category. So um,
And so that means we allow only P1 its dual and then um, co-limits D suspension and um, tensor products on this. So this gets it down to the varieties I actually do know well. Um, and now there's another issue before I can really know very much about this category, which is that you know, if I take the algebraic K theory, like this category isn't going to know about algebraic K theory pretty well. If I take K of C and I rationalize it, this is really hard to understand. The rational algebraic K theory of C is just really difficult to say the least to get a handle on what's going on in here. And that extends really to the, this whole category. If I don't rationalize it, it, it just has a lot of information that I don't necessarily want to contend with. Um, so, we'll be complete. Okay. So now we have to rise that B complete, cellular C motivic category as sort of the the kind of way we want to arrive at, we remove all the things we don't know how much to say about. Of course, that's no guarantee that we'll be able to say anything about this particular category. Um, but in fact, you know, over the past 20 years, we actually have been able to say a tremendous amount about this category. And so much and so that uh, once I write a big theorem on the board, we're going to get to, you know, have this category leave the building. And those of you who aren't comfortable with motives can rest a little easier. So, theorem. And as far as I can tell, I probably want to attribute this to, I'm going to have to abbreviate names because it gets so long. Uh, Vavodsky, Dr. Isaacson, Levine, Gergay, Gergay Wang Shu. Gowski and Gergay Isaacson and Krauser Rika, you know, all played their part in um, verifying the following theorem for us, which is that um, this category, a state of C, cellular, C complete, is a one parameter deformation. By this, what I mean is that it is a, we have a symmetric monoidal functor from filtered spectra into this category. <clears throat> right, so filtered spectra you can view as being the spectral analog of A1 mod GM. The change of filtration is the coordinate on the A1. The fact that you can only change coordinate and you're very restricted in what you can do is, in a sense, is the fact that we've taken the geo equivariant things. And so we expect to see sort of one, you know, very degenerate, you know, special fiber and then a single special fiber corresponding to the whole GM orbit of A1 mod GM. And so having a symmetric linear functor like this should be saying that this guy, this category is behaving like a one parameter deformation. It's going to have one special fiber and, and one generic fiber. And what we know about this is that the generic fiber is the complete spectra. And the special fiber is end of perfect complexes on the moduli of formal groups. Okay, and so this is pretty great, and you know, in here we have you know the unit and the unit shifted by one, and um, yeah. and that tau, if you're not familiar with tau in the motivic setting, is exactly the shift map, and so. A good example of a, an algebra where 1 mod v is a commutative algebra is 1 mod tau here is the algebra whose modules are graded spectra and tensoring with 
one mod tau corresponds to passing from a filtered spectrum to an associated gradient. And so when we take base change that to here, that will correspond to having an object, the cofiber tau, with a community developer structure whose modules are, you know, whose category modules is equivalent to this category. And if we had inverted tau, we would have gotten this category. Okay. And now I can state the theorem, which is that spec of SHMC cellular to complete is describable. And let's call this a meta theorem because I'm saying it's describable. And my goal by the end of the talk probably won't be accomplished, but maybe kind of close, <laughs> is to uh, describe the Balmer spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. This is what? So describable is a technical term that implies and No, no, des describable is a non technical term. It means that I can tell you the answer. Um, I might even say strongly describable in that I believe that I can tell you the answer and I think you can understand the answer. <laughs> you want to switch to black or your hmm? your You just wrote this one. Wait. Okay. Huh, did I switch them twice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Or it started and then uh, on to the. Yeah. yeah. Oh. points of the Balmer spectrum of these things, and then we're going to get as far as we can in the topology. Um, so it's now not right there, but were it there, we would have this lemma about how when we have a commutative algebra, we get a decomposition of the Balmer spectrum into an open piece and a closed piece, and we have this element tau, and the cofiber of tau is a commutative algebra, so we can do this decomposition. So we, you know, apply this open and closed decomposition. Along tau. And what we get is we get a category a copy of the P complete category of spectrum, and we get a copy of, uh, let's say compact there, and we get a copy of the turf and FG complete. Um, and this guy is the open piece. This guy is the closed piece. And on this, you know, this open piece, you know, we can think of this as this is where all the topology is happening. And this is all algebra. And what's great is, you know, normally you think of the, the topology as being the hard part, and that's already solved for us. So you might think we're in good shape, but actually this algebra part just ends up being wicked hard. Um, but and then, of course, you have to glue them together. And that's probably, you know, the diceiest part of it all. Um, but let's just recall that we know, you know, what happens here. We get that spec. This guy, you know, is going to be this 
the space H that I, uh, I defined as this you know, sequence of points. OK, so now what can we do here um, to analyze this category? Well, you know, the first thing we could do is we could do this uh, decomposition along P. So, you know, phi open close along P. And now because we're talking about the P complete category, when we invert P, we get zero, um, just because it's the, the compact objects in a P complete category, the P torsion only ones. And so we, we, we just reduce to MFG, say, times spec FG. OK, that wasn't crazy interesting. But now, when we're talking about MFG times spec FP, there's you know a line bundle on this guy, which is the Lie algebra of the formal group. And some power of it has a section, which is the, the first half invariant, which is V1. And so we can take that guy and apply this, this decomposition again. And so now we get an open piece, which is modified formal groups of height exactly one, and we get a closed piece, which is MFG equal to two. Formal groups of height at least two, exactly one. This is open, this is closed. Where is where could you from? Uh, that's Z mod P. Like, open mm -hmm. So, yeah, so when we invert P on the P complete category, we get zero. And when we mod out by P, we get FP. And so we're now looking at like. It's a, it's a product of C. It's a product of this. I, I get right that it's over spec no, no, no. Z instead of spec F1 if you're, you know, I mean, it's a truly postmodern person. Also very good, um, very good, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, and so you might be seeing the pattern here that I'm going to do this along V2 and V3 and V4 and so on. So let me just jump to the end here and say that we get a, um, we can decompose into locally closed pieces, MFG equals 1, MFG equals 2. MFG equals three. And then we have this guy at the top here, MFG equals infinity. And so now we have uh, two separate problems. The first is to analyze each of these quiet height pieces. And then the last piece is we need to analyze what happens at height infinity. Okay. So at finite height, I find height we're in quite good shape because this guy perf on MFG equals N, that's the same as you know graded um, KN, I think it's sigma and star co-modules, which has an atoll extension, which is just Graded represent you know it has an atoll extension which is just ungraded representations of the Morava stabilizer group, and we have enough you know we know enough atoll descents for spectra that what we can do is, is we can compute it for uh, representations of the Morava stabilizer group and we can try to descend down and it'll be particularly easy for us to descend down because the group the Galois group will descend the space will be a space that doesn't admit any group actions it makes descent particularly easy so. We get down to um, you know representations of the Morava stabilizer group on I think it's F P to the N. And now this is where you know a while ago I, I cited this result of Benson uh, and Krause that's going to tell us that uh, you know we can see you know the homogeneous spectrum is going to correctly record across the Balmer spectrum and. Um, Galur has an extension of this to profinite groups. And so here we can actually just um, we just look at spec H of the non-stabilizer group. 
Wait. Still pushing even after the end. That actually is trivial. Um, or sorry, spec H of cohomology of this guy. And now here we can um, use Quillen's work to say that what we really need to do is figure out what this is up to F isomorphism, which is all spec H is going to see, is we need to think about the collection of elementary abelian subgroups up to conjugacy. Um, but the thing is, is what, what is this a pro? This is an intergroup. Mm -hmm. Can you apply fluid serum to the normal skip to a group? Or? Uh, I think I can't apply it, but I think there's an extension of it that I can apply because it's a piatic lead group. Mm. I think there's an extension to the hand. You need to know that the homology is finitely generated, but it is because it's a piatic lead group. Okay, yeah. And what's great here is that up to conjugacy, there's only one elementary abelian subgroup inside of here. It's C2. And I even have a good choice of generator. It's the automorphism of uh, a formal group given by the minus 1 series. And so the minus 1 series acts you know, as, a, as a C2, because the square of the minus 1 series is the 1 series. And so what we see is then that all we have to look at is spec H of the cohomology of C2. And so what we get is we get two points and a closed set. And because, you know, this is, but that's the modern spectrum of a, a polynomial generator. And what's great about this is, you know, we have to do kind of a, a Galois descent back down to go from, you know, this kind of twisted, the twisted GN modules to the untwisted ones. But this, this space just doesn't emit group actions, which is very convenient. So take the quotient, but that action had to be trivial. Okay, so now in the, my remaining, what do I have, six minutes? Hmm? Well, I only switch the prime two here or something. Hmm? Equal to the prime. Equals two. Yeah. Yes. Did, did, did we suddenly switch to the prime two or something? Yeah, uh, right there. A long time ago. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, and I forgot to continue using twos. Um, so everything I've said here actually just works as stated until exactly this moment. And at this moment, um, sometimes there's a CP subgroup, and sometimes there's not. And we know when there is a CP subgroup, and when there's not, the ball spectrum is one point, because the cohomology is uh, now going to be finally generated. Um, and in the case when there is a CP subgroup, it's when the P minus 1 is divided into height, if I recall. And so then we get either two points or one point. Um, but that's kind of a, only a mild thing, but there's going to be much more serious things that uh, requires to be at 2 and specifically at 2 a little later in the part I'm probably not going to talk about. <laughs> um, it comes down to the fact that uh, this minus 1 series is a global object. Like you can talk about the minus 1 series on the whole moduli of formal groups. And so in particular, you can like, you have a pullback map to BC2 from, you know, formal groups in, in characteristic 2. You know, we have a minus 1 series on all of them, so we still have a global C2 across all finite heights. And that tells us how to glue all the finite heights together in the Balmer spectrum. But um, on the moduli formal groups in characteristic P, we don't have a global CP. Um, and in fact, I think our argument will ver verbatim compute uh, the Balmer spectrum of the moduli of formal ZP adjoined zeta P modules. But that's kind of an instance of uh, who cares, nobody asked. <laughs> Which is rather unfortunate because our result really is at the prime two and only the prime two. Well, and now you're doing it again. You're erasing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, I'm nothing not consistent. <laughs>
So at height infinity, what we see is we see a copy of automorphisms of the formal additive group, which is the only height infinity formal group. And that is the polynomial part in the dual Steenbrot algebra. And so our remaining problem is we want to know, or the remaining problem before we need to start working out how to put all these pieces back together again is what is spec of Steenbrot kill modules. And here we have some great help because John Palmieri wrote a whole book on this and he got very close to answering the question. And so we can, you know, stand on the shoulders of, you know, his 150 page long book um, that goes back to some like, you know, you know, all this sort of in the 70s, like a lot of thinking on CMOD models. And we get to just use the, uh, the cream of the crop from all that and, um, you know, put the final touches on figuring out what this is. Um, and let me just say that sort of our only, or our main contribution here is that we say that this thing, that uh, CMR co models is GM separable. And that's enough because in Paul Mary's book, he already computes what the periodicity sheaf is and gives an explicit description of it. And so once you know that it's GM separable, you can get the whole Wolmer spectrum from that. Um, and how does he do this? You know, what he does is he constructs you know, some guy uh, HD, and then you have Yeah, he, he constructs this guy, HD, sits over the Steenard algebra, and where on HD, the homogeneous spectrum of the NMOs into the unit matches the Balmer spectrum. And he gives a precise formula for what up to FIS morsum you see on HD. And then he says that downstairs, if you want to compute endomorphism the up to F isomorphism, what you do is, is you have a group action on the guy upstairs, and you pull something back, compute endomorphisms there, and then take fixed points for the group action. And unfortunately, that group is uh, infinite dimensional, so there's not so much hope of writing down a closed form for the fixed points. Um, but this seems like a good point to stop and not, uh, not open a whole new can of worms with uh, zero seconds left. Thanks for your time.